The human soul has a minimum daily requirement of entertainment, but listening to a podcast like you're doing right now, yeah, that doesn't count. Welcome to the world of MGM Rewards, where we have the greatest live shows on earth, the biggest names in sports, the best chefs on the planet, and the most unforgettable nights of your life. This is way beyond watching 20-second clips on your phone. This is all the entertainment you can handle and more. So join MGM Rewards now and visit MGMResorts.com to book your next Vegas getaway. Welcome to the show. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Welcome to Inside the Mavs, the official Mavericks podcast for 97.1 The Freak. I'm your host, Kevin Gray, Mavs pre- and post-game host on the Dallas Mavericks Radio Network 97.1 The Freak. Really appreciate you joining us here on the show joined as always by my partner grant afseth mav sports illustrated writer covering the dallas mavericks as the mavericks get ready to take on the los angeles clippers on wednesday before visiting the houston rockets on friday before returning home to take on victor Wimbanyama and the san antonio spurs on saturday a lot to cover here on this episode recapping what happened against the Denver Nuggets on Monday night as the Mavs continue uh, a difficult three-game stretch here with the Nuggets, the Clippers, and the Rockets, as I mentioned, on Friday. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. You can find Grant on Twitter at Grant Asseth. As I bring in Grant on the show today, Grant, what's going on? How are we doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad to be back in Dallas uh, after Portland and Denver. Uh, some, some pretty cold uh, cold places for sure. So um, I'm excited for tonight. Uh, it will be interesting to watch against the Clippers team that's playing really well for sure. Yeah, Clippers team that's hot right now, having won their last eight straight games, nine and one in their last ten, have climbed all the way up to the sixth spot right now where currently – they have the same record as the Dallas Mavericks at 16 and 10. So James Harden and the Clippers have been playing really good basketball. We'll get into some of that matchup here as the show goes on. And again, you can download and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast for free. Make sure you get the podcast a five star rating and write a review while you're there. Tell your friends and your family to check out Inside the Mavs. You can also watch the show on my YouTube channel at Kevin Gray Sports. You can also watch it on Grant's channel at Grant Asseth. Make sure you subscribe to both our channels there for your latest Mavericks coverage. Before we get to the Clippers game on Wednesday, let's take a quick look back at what happened on Monday in Denver as the Dallas Mavericks unfortunately fall to the Denver Nuggets once again and also in the process losing the season series even with one game to go in March. Mavericks fall 130 to 104 on the road. If you had told me, Grant, that the Mavericks would hold Nikola Jokic to single digits in terms of points scored, I would tell you that the Mavericks had a pretty good shot of winning that game, except, oh, Aaron Gordon that had other ideas on the night as he went for 21 points, uh, going 7-9 from the field. Jamal Murray had 22 points as well. Nikola on the night had 8 points, 7 assists, and 9 rebounds. Rather pedestrian for the um, two-time league MVP, but at the same time, it was the others for Denver that really took it to the Mavericks in that game on Monday. Yeah, definitely. I think if you watch uh, the Nuggets a lot, uh, one of the things that you see is the Mavericks are usually one of those aggressive, like double team uh, sort of, uh, you know, defensive approaches that, you know, the Joker typically sees. And, you know, I think they just had a hard time accounting for, you know, rotating out of that double team to be able to handle Jamal Murray, Aaron Gordon, and all those other players as well that they have that can make you pay off the ball. And that's just, you know, a big reason why the Nuggets are the reigning champions. They just make you pay so much. You try to take something away, they have a lot of ways to make you pay for it. And I think we continue to see the things that we talk about pretty often about the, you know, lack of size of some of these positions. Like, you know, Aaron Gordon, whether as a cutter or on the glass, made the Mavericks pay at times. And, you know, overall in the half court, uh, it was one area, but in transition, that was also continuing to be a problem. They allowed, you know, 36 transition points. Uh, you know, that was a season high for Denver and they had 14 alone in the first quarter. And, you know, that, that was a big, uh, 
you know, obvious, obvious factor there. I think the Mavericks struggled to get back on defense, whether it was off missed shots and, you know, the Nuggets grabbed the rebound or there were some turnovers early on where the Mavericks were, you know, struggling to kind of see those different looks that the Nuggets were throwing at them and pick and roll coverages. So I think there's a lot to clean up, but Denver is definitely becoming one of those spots where they're just struggling sorely to, to execute. They've allowed the Nuggets to shoot over 50% from the floor in four consecutive games in Denver. And yeah, there's just definitely a, uh, a lot of things if you're going through a, a film session that you would definitely want to point out uh, on both sides of the ball. Yeah, Clippers shooting 56% from the field, nearly 54% from three. They had six guys in double figures. I mean, even Reggie Jackson had 20 points going 9 of 12 from the field. We know that Reggie Jackson likes to play well against the Dallas Mavericks. If you watched him throughout his time when he was with the Los Angeles Clippers, again, we'll talk about the Clippers here in a little bit. But it just felt like, you know, and I'll use a football analogy because, you know, people talk about the Cowboys and the 49ers and how bad of a matchup that is for the Cowboys every time they take on the 49ers. It feels like the same when it comes to the clip, or excuse me, when it comes to the Mavericks and the Nuggets. It feels like just a bad matchup for this team when it faces the Nuggets every time out. And I know there was no Derek Lively once again. There was no Kyrie Irving as well. So it was it was going to be tough on this front court to deal with Nikola Jokic. But as you mentioned, it was the others like Aaron Gordon, and I felt like they played just a step faster in that game against Dallas, then Dallas was able to keep up with, even with Luka Doncic dropping, you know, 38 points and 11 rebounds in the game. It just felt like the Mavericks were a step slow and the Nuggets really kind of just handled their business. And again, much like how we saw the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, you know, a few games ago, they kind of just walked down the Mavericks and were just able to really take it to them throughout the course of the game. The It never felt like the Nuggets were bothered at all in this game against the Mavericks in that way. Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely a theme there where, you know, the struggle with size, if they're able Mm -hmm. to still spread the floor while having that size and be able to execute enough defensively, then, you know, those are going to be naturally challenging matches for the Mavs. And I think that's just, that just shows you where an opportunity should probably be looked at for, you know, potential roster changes in the long term, you know, focus of continuing to add pieces around like Luca Kyrie and Derek Lively is, you definitely need to add some size to that four spot. I think I think even if you look at that one game against Portland, Jeremy Grant was getting to the spots that he wanted to pretty mm-hmm. easily, and he looked like he had a pretty you know solid size advantage as well. Like it, that is definitely uh, when you're comparing the size, like Jeremy Grant compared to like Carl Towns, there's an even greater difference there too. So that that's <laughs> like obviously, so like that's uh, you know, and Aaron Gordon as well. Like there, there's just situations there where you're going to run into some some problems if you're not able to handle that size. And if you go through the, like, you know, obviously the trailblazers are towards the bottom of the standings. They're not the top priority of what you're, you're planning your roster around, but the top of the Western conference right now, there's a lot of teams with that type of size uh, that can pose a lot of problems. And, you know, especially with the Mavericks playing without Derek Lively against the Nuggets, you know, it felt a lot like that roster that was playing while Kyrie was uh, sideline, like right before the all-star break last year, mm-hmm. where Luca tried to do what he could do to will the team. Uh, you know, to a respectable, well, hopefully a win, but in in all reality, you know, it ended up being a loss uh, in that game and this game. So I think, uh, you know, overall, like that just shows the the limitation of the depth when you're down four players that are so important, but then also specifically at the center position. If you're not going to play, you know, guys like a, like a Rashawn Holmes, and you're going to rely maybe on like a a smaller option, like, you know, like a Markeith Morris than your typical like shot blocking center, that probably also shows another roster area where you might want to investigate some potential options where you have more of that interior presence. Because if Lively, you know, goes down, you probably don't want to be relying too much on, on one uh, one center to make plays, especially if he's, you know, also still uh, a 19 year old as well. For mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, and it's interesting. We were looking at not only the size differential; it felt like from a, a speed and a quickness differential. You know, the Mavericks just did not have it on on Monday. And, you know, as you look at the rest of the season as it goes on, you know, you lose the tiebreaker already having lost the first two games to the Nuggets. So in what has been a tight West so far, even in late December, we're starting to look at things like tiebreakers when you start playing teams multiple times about what that means for later on in the season when you're looking at seeding and trying to figure where the Mavericks are going to be you know, situated as far as the top six are concerned and another one of those games tonight when they take on the Clippers. Before we get there, though, I want to touch on this because 
you know, Luca, as I mentioned, had 38, you know, and 11 in the game with another eight assists going 13 and 24 from the field. Dante Exum was the only other Maverick in double figures, ironically, actually had a perfect night going five for five from the field. The Dante Exum in 22 minutes of play, not much else from anyone else in terms of the Mavericks on that night, though. But the reason why I want to stop down on Luca is because, you know, we've seen the elevated nature of his game so far. He's shooting a career high, you know, 37, 38% from three, averaging over 32 points per game. Obviously, we know what kind of passer he is. He's third in the NBA or fourth in the NBA in terms of assists. You know, like he's playing at a MVP-like level right now. But I read something very interesting from Kevin O'Connor of the Ringer that I want to make sure that we discuss because the absurdity of the number, and you can speak to it as someone who analyzed the game and looks at some of the numbers of the game, Lucas so far going into that game against Denver, shooting over 82% from the restricted area. And when you look at that number, you say, wow, that's a whopping number. But then when you start putting it into context, that's better than someone like Giannis so far this year, shooting over 82% in the restricted area. I think it just speaks to the level at which Lucas playing with not only getting downhill, but the amount of efficiency that he's showing at the rim and where we know in the past that he's been able to be really good in the restricted area. 82% in that area is an absurd number when you put it into context in that way. Yeah. Especially like, you know, you think of uh, a lot of high flying, like play finishers, like Derek Lively is the type of guys you yeah. that would shoot that efficiently. And, you know, it's just a true testament to how, you know, just much of a mastermind Luca is at picking his spots, getting to his spots. And then when he's there, he's very patient. Like, you know, like when he gets really deep on the drive, doesn't put it up at first, the way he like fakes a pass around the defender and then tries to create that advantage, things like that, that you just don't really see from really any other player. If you do, it's very few players. So, you know, just overall, it's just a fascinating thing to continue to see him to get better every year. When, uh, you know, we entered this year and there was concerns about like, you know, oh, how is that thigh injury going to impact him? You know, all all that type of stuff. And he just continues haven't been talking to, about it. Yeah, haven't, haven't been talking about it. Yeah, haven't talked about it really at all. And he just continued to, uh, you know, elevate his game. And that's even with some of these uh, like day, like day to day type of injuries. Like he injured his his hand in L A. the first time, or yeah, the first road game against the Clip. Well, it'll be the only road game against the Clippers this season. But you mm-hmm. you know that uh, that around Thanksgiving he. He injured that hand and he's, you know, that we haven't really even had a situation where we're like, Oh, he's shooting poorly. Could it be his hand? Anything like that. So it's just kind of a fascinating thing that he continues to sustain like this level of play. And it's really regardless of matchup. Like he, he once yes. the nuggets, yeah. Once the nuggets were, you know, blitzing and pick and roll coverage to try to protect Jokic, he was a passer. Uh, he made the right reads and picked his spots and once they went to switching one through five, when Jokic was off the floor, he just heated up. He made six threes in the second quarter. And that was actually the most threes or tied for the most threes by any player in a single quarter against the Nuggets since like 96, 97 season. So like once, once he sees a, s- a certain type of coverage, he knows exactly how he's going to attack it. And he's just so good that there's just not really anything the other team can do, but just try to keep mixing it up and disrupt his rhythm and hope that you know, the opposite or his supporting cast uh, doesn't make them pay for daring them to shoot and things of that nature. I mean, he's got, a you know, 11 straight games now scoring at least 30 points in a game. He's shooting, you know, over 38 percent from three. You know, he's shooting nearly 50 percent from the field. And one thing, and I've talked about this in the past with other people before, and I told people, I said, look, if Luka Doncic ever gets close to being an 80 to 82 percent free throw shooter, there is nothing the league can do with him anymore because now not only is he finishing at the rim, we know what kind of mid-range game that he has. Now he's becoming an even more devastating three-point shooter. And now when you foul him, he's going to be converting at the free throw line. He's going to be a walking 30 points every single night because he's going to get to the line seven to eight times a night. He's going to get 20 to 25 shot attempts every single night as well. He's going to put points on the board. And at this point, That, to me, is the most fascinating part about this is how do teams now try to find a way to stop him or at least try to slow him down? Because based on the way he's performing and he's playing 37 minutes a night, there's nothing teams can do with him anymore now that he's converting at the free throw line at the rate that he is, which is something that I've been wanting to see if he could develop. He's doing that now where he's normally a career 74% free throw shooter. Now he's hitting nearly 80% of his free throws. I don't know what teams are going to be able to do with him from now on now. 
Yeah, definitely. I actually asked him about that in Portland because he was shooting like in at that time, the last five games, he was shooting like something absurd, like over 95% uh, over that block of games. And he was just saying like, it's just funny how easy the game is for him. He's just like, you know, I just take my time, you know, uh, and just focus on the details, breathe a little bit. And it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> like, like <laughs> Good for you. Good for like, you. Yeah, he always, like anytime you ask him about the game itself, it's just everything is just so easy to him. It's just it's always interesting you know like some players will give you like a, a really like comprehensive like diagnosis of the situation he's just like you know they, they doubled me i passed it they you know they didn't double me i just you know made six threes on them you know like like that that was also in denver they, they were they were someone was asking him you know what went well for you in that second quarter where you scored like i forgot exactly how many it was it was like 22 points or something mm-hmm. and he yeah. was like you know they just started switching one through five I was like, oh, okay, so then you're just going to destroy them? They start switching? That's as easy as it is? Okay. Well, uh, yeah, uh, well, keep, keep going. All right, cool. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all right, like, cool. It's just, it's just kind of fascinating the way you know he processes the game. And you're right. You know, the, the free throw shooting, that's a big part of it. And, uh, you know, some would say getting more calls would also be a good part of it, too. Cause Imagine that. Lately, yeah, he's been getting knocked in the face and things like that. And, like I, I remember, uh, you know, against the Nuggets, he got hit in the face, uh, like a, the offhand or off arm, with, and uh, he was bleeding, and they had to clean it mm-hmm. off. And he he didn't get a foul call, and the ref was like right there. And you know, this isn't a ref show by any stretch, but uh, sometimes uh, you know it's kind of interesting how you know physical he plays, and you know, I guess some guys are naturally hard to officiate, but mm-hmm. that's another another interesting part of it is uh, you know as he continues to become more efficient, it'll be interesting, you know, just overall how sometimes these uh, these referee crews will make these calls for him on these drives because th- sometimes in general you, you already look at what he's doing, as you mentioned, with the restricted area efficiency. Imagine how much more efficient he'd even be if, you know, sometimes he got a little, a little higher percentage of those calls on those drives that aren't ending in an in occasional miss that are turning into trips to the free throw line. So I think, you know, that'll be another thing as, you know, we kind of go throughout the season, just what his volume of free throw attempts are like. Because with Kyrie out and how aggressive he is attacking, you would think that uh, he'd be taking like, what, a good 12 a game plus p- potentially. So that's something that I'll be interested to see, you know, whether it's like tonight or, you know, throughout the the rest of this period where Kyrie will be potentially sidelined for is just how often he'll get to the free throw line, how efficient he'll be. And, you know, those are important factors too, because that's also a a good sign of, you know, how durable, like his stamina he's got going on too, is like, Mm -hmm. you know, whenever you're attacking the paint frequently, getting to the line, finishing with efficiency, you know, on those drives, that's a great sign for someone who's continuing to play over 40 minutes on a consistent basis at this point putting up 30 point games uh, and not showing any sign of slowing down. That's a great way to continue to sustain that level of play is to get to the line and, you know, knock down those shots, as you said. And it's interesting because you brought up a point about, you know, the physicality and the nature of which he's playing the game and which other teams are playing him with. I wonder, because we talk about the amount of free throws that he's getting. You mentioned this could be a guy that could be a 10 to 12, you know, a night guy at the free throw line. I wonder because of, and this is just a part of his game and a part of what we've talked about with him, the amount of constant that he has done throughout the course of his career, the technical fouls, which we have seen at an alarming rate for him, even even for Luka Doncic, the amount of technical fouls that he's being assessed while we've seen some of them be rescinded in that nature. I wonder if he's not getting some of those calls because of the reputation that he's developed as a guy that's a little bit of a hothead at times and still the difficulty when it comes to officiating him already that he may be getting some of the quote-unquote, I don't know, Shaquille O'Neal treatment when it comes to the inability to get calls because of how physical of a player that he is, but also you marry that with the idea that, hey, he likes to talk a lot, so maybe he not is not getting some of the benefit of those calls because of his reputation that precedes him each time he steps onto the floor to play a game every night. I personally think it's probably a combination of the two. It was definitely uh, that way during the FIBA World Cup. When when watching some of those refs, they were a little uh, quicker with the whistle than the NBA, but you could tell from the jump they were like, oh, you're talking? Okay, tech. And then it's like, oh, uh, oh, even though this is a game where if you lose, you're out, oh, you're still talking? Oh, okay, uh, you're out of here. <laughs> like It was just like yeah. it was kind of a less extreme version of that to an extent where, I mean, obviously it's a bit like tossed out of – out of these games or anything, but there are, there have been some like really late texts that are kind of, kind of interesting where it's like 
I don't really know how many times I've seen like a final minute of regulation the games kind of over and two players are talking and one guy gets a tech, like it's very interesting. Uh, like, like weird lack of uh, consistency sometimes in the NBA with like little things like that. But as you, you know, just talking about the thing that you mentioned, like with the Shaquille O'Neal uh, treatment, I definitely do think it is challenging to officiate someone who's that strong and creates advantages with their pace because, you know, sometimes it should be a little clear. I, I would feel like with vantage points that refs have where, you know, someone getting knocked in the face. But I do think in general with how patient he is and how just poised he looks, even when he's playing through contact, I could see where some officiating crews may have a harder time being like, okay, that guy was clearly impacted because he's not someone that's going to like just flail and like just crash to the floor on a very frequent basis and yell, uh, you know, he'll, as you said, he will do talking after the play. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I do think that definitely there's a human element to it for the officials. I think sometimes that, that comes into play. Like, uh, I definitely have noticed sometimes during games where, you know, you know, a certain, uh, certain crew is out there for sure. Yes. Uh, uh based off of how, you know, calls are, are coming, how they're not coming, how texts are, are occurring and all that stuff. So, yeah, I definitely think uh, that'll be interesting like throughout the rest of the season to kind of monitor because, I, I mean, even like some of these uh, like role players that are in the league, you can tell they have certain officials that, uh, you know, ha have them on their, uh, oh, you're talking uh, mm -hmm. tech, tech uh, sort of lists for sure. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that that discussion gets you know brought up in terms of the amount of free throws that he does and doesn't take, and I wonder if there's a correlation with obviously some of the reputation that he has not getting some of those foul calls and how that is translated to his sometimes not getting some of the calls that he's deserved based off of the physical nature you know that he's being played and officiated or not being officiated with based off of the way that he's the way that he's playing, something that will definitely continue to you know monitor throughout the course of the season because I find it fascinating that some of the physical play that he's been receiving that normally would be foul calls he's not getting, and I just wonder if it's in officials' head that he has done the amount of talking that he has done to get technicals and how that's affected the way that he's being officiated because some of that stuff, like you mentioned the Denver game, it was absurd the amount of physical content that he was taking and not getting foul calls based on that so we'll see how that continues to, to play itself out but i just thought that was an interesting you know topic of discussion based off of you know what luka Doncic has been feeling so far but i mean he's definitely i mean for you i'm sure for me he's at the top of the mvp conversation while you look at Giannis and what he's been doing so far joel Embiid, you know with the six is what he's doing you know jason tatum and jalen brown they're playing really well in boston right now luka Doncic is carrying that team you know tremendously based off of what he is doing so it's been fun to watch him so far as this team has gone on, and he's playing at an extremely high level so far this season. Um, as we get ready to close the show today, let's get into the Clippers preview. Uh, the Clippers taking on the Dallas Mavericks on Wednesday night right now uh, at 16 and 10. Clippers at 16 and 10 as well, but they've won eight straight games. They're looking for their ninth consecutive win are the Clippers as they're playing really, really good basketball right now. What has been the difference that you've seen with this Clippers team, aside from obviously what James Harden's been doing, that's allowed them to play as well as they have been right now? Yeah, I definitely think it is a big part of like that lineup change that they made where James Harden's starting, Russell Westbrook's coming off the bench. They've had some time to build some continuity with that play style. And, you know, I think uh, when guys like Paul George, Kawhi Leonard get comfortable, they have skill sets that can work with just about any type of personnel. They could play off the ball. Whenever they have a matchup that they like, they can dominate you know, ISO and just run actions for them. And I think, you know, having those guys balanced, spaced out throughout the course of a game where they're, you know, having stretches where they're able to take over things a little bit, I think that goes a long way. And I think they, if I remember correctly, they put up over 150 points against the Pacers uh, in, their, in their last yeah. game. And it was so bad that Rick Carlisle was like, we're going to get a physical practice in. We're going to really work. Something that we haven't done in a while. <laughs> <laughs> like that's how, that's how bad that was for the Pacers. Uh, you know, I think I think Miles Turner was out, uh, so that definitely did not help the Pacers. But you know, still, regardless, they've been giving up a ton of points. You know, no matter who's putting on a jersey for them, and the Clippers, you know, maximized that punishment for sure uh, last game. And I think uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see who suits up uh, against the Mavs tonight because you know they have a couple guys with illnesses like Paul George, Norman Powell. Neither of those guys were at shoot around. They're both questionable. It you know remains to be seen if they'll end up playing. And that'll definitely change up the way the Clippers look because 
know, they just have a lot of ways to attack you throughout 48 minutes at this point. Like even Norman Powell, he's not someone that you would, you know, come up with on the list of like, you know, critical factors on the Clippers, like super early because they got you know future Hall of Famers, uh, you know, throughout like the rotation. But he's definitely someone that can go off and really makes teams pay as that like weak side spacer that just attacks you know, off the dribble or off the catch and things like that whenever you're doubling Kawhi Leonard. And that's something that the Mavericks have actually struggled with at times is really trying to get the ball out of Kawhi's hands and then it pops around and then making those extra efforts and, you know, protecting the paint, uh, which, you know, has been a struggle throughout the season, but is going to be even more of a struggle, you know, naturally as you don't have Derek Lively in the lineup. Uh, so that how all those things get sorted out uh, will be something to watch throughout the game. But, uh, you know, Clippers are definitely a matchup that Luka Doncic tends to like, regardless of who's suiting up for, you know, for them. But last time they faced off, the Mavericks had a season low 88 points. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And, you know, that was a, that was definitely a flat performance. You know, a lot of the complimentary players weren't hitting shots, but even despite that, you know, they still had very like solid games from Luka and Kyrie. I remember it was like, around two minutes, 11 seconds, something crazy like that in the first first half, like before halftime, until someone not named Luca or Kyrie made a field goal uh, in that matchup. So we're definitely going to yeah. have to see a lot more production from, you know, the, the non-superstar players, especially in a game that, you know, Kyrie is not going to be available for as well. Yeah, these two teams have split the first two games of their season series so far. Mavericks got the 144-126 win back on November the 10th. Luka Doncic had 44 points that night, going off for 17-21 to from the field. You mentioned the game on November 25th. That was during the Thanksgiving holiday where they had those two games in Los Angeles. They beat L.A. on that Wednesday, and then they lost by 19 to the Clippers the following Saturday on the 25th, where Luka, he did have 30 that night, but went one of eight from three. And you mentioned it. It's going to be about the others in this game against Los Angeles because they present a deep bench that has a lot of guys that can score. But more importantly, what you didn't see in Denver has to show up against the Clippers on Wednesday night, which is the other guys, whether it be you know Dante Exum, whether it be other guys coming along with Luka because they're going to be in a tight bind if they're not going to get production from anyone else other than Luka Dodgers because you saw it on Monday, all the heroics that he had it didn't matter because of how deep Denver was and how much better they were, but you couldn't get any contributions from anybody else. That made it much more difficult to try to get a win. That can't happen against Clip- the Clippers because if you don't, they'll run you out of the building, much like how Denver did on Monday. Yeah, definitely, because if you just look at the breakdown of like how the Mavericks will have to approach you know, their defensive responsibilities without Lively, they, they, they struggle pretty much yes. all season protecting the paint without him on the floor. So that'll probably just be a shoe. And you could, unless something like an anomaly happens, you could probably expect that. That's probably pretty safe. Just like Denver, even Portland, all those other re- recent games as well. Uh, even when if he does play and he's not on the floor, it's been a struggle. But uh, then th- this is a team that the Mavericks like to, you know, as we mentioned with the double teams, uh, you're not going to just allow someone like, you know, Kawhi Leonard to pick you apart in single coverage matchups. So that that's going to put even more stress on the defense and how they're able to, you know, make those extra efforts as they continue to work on those types of things with their defense will be important because there was a major letdown against the Nuggets, I felt like, where there naturally there's things where, you know, you're just going to have a disadvantage based off personnel because sometimes, as you said, there's bad matchups. Like, that's just the reality of the situation. Not every team's mm-hmm. going to be perfect against every other team in the league. But, you know, there are things that you have to overcompensate for whenever you do know that, you know, this you know front court has more size than us. You can't get beat on the glass, especially like ball watching, things like that. And, you know, against the Clippers, they're definitely a team that can spread you out, make you pay. And Zubach is available. You know, he's he's going to be very active on the boards. He had a big impact in that regard on that, you know, around Thanksgiving matchup that, you know, we talked about. And, you know, that that's going to be something to definitely keep an eye on is how they close plays because, you know, entering the season, uh, that was a big point of emphasis for, you know, this team and a lot of their commentary was, you know, we got to be better on defense, but we do feel like we do a solid job of forcing misses. We just have to close possessions with getting the rebound. And, you know, they've had some solid games this season doing that, but, you know, without Derek Lively, especially, they're going to have to really hone in on those details and lock in because a loss 
you know, two in a row. It's not obviously the end of the world by any stretch, but it starts to add up because this is, you know, as you said with the tiebreakers, this is the deciding matchup. Uh, both teams are one and one against each other. They only play three times on the whole season. So the winner will take mm-hmm. the tiebreaker and you've already lost it with Denver. So then you're in a situation where, you know, you're starting to add up those, the losing end of the tiebreakers and you don't want to be a playing team in a perfect world. And, you know, as the seating continues to develop, it doesn't take you very long to, you know, miss some key players and all of a sudden you sink down the standings and you're like seventh or eighth in the West. So mm-hmm. definitely going to be important to hone in on that. And then, you know, it's not easy to ever play a back-to-back in the NBA, and that's what they have this weekend against two in-state uh, rivals. You know, Houston on the road, who are like they, they are very good at Toyota Center. That'll be a challenge, and then you know, naturally, any team on the second half of back-to-backs will be a challenge, even if it's the Spurs who are, you know, struggling to win you know, games on a consistent basis this season after having that lengthy losing streak. So overall, this you know tonight will be very important for the Mavericks for sure. Yeah, the importance of tonight's game can be overstated, as you mentioned, with the tiebreaker at stake and how this will look as the rest of the season goes on. I want to run it down real quick before we get out of here, what the Clippers win streak has looked like. I mean, they've beaten Golden State, Denver, Utah, Portland, San, uh, Sacramento, Golden State again, New York, and Indiana. So, you know, the opponent that they've beaten, the opponents that they've beaten, they've beaten some quality teams here, and they continue their own difficult stretch with Dallas on Wednesday, then they have a back-to-back when they take on the Oklahoma City Thunder on Thursday, and then they go back home to begin a nice little homestand where they welcome the Boston Celtics to town. So between Dallas, the Thunder, and the Celtics, you know the Clippers have got a little bit of a difficult stretch right now, but, I mean, they have played extremely efficient basketball. Kawhi Leonard playing well right now. He's playing a lot. Here's, here's the biggest thing. Kawhi Leonard's playing a lot. <laughs> when he's playing a lot, he's been devastatingly good for them, which is something that we thought if that could happen for the Clippers, him playing consistent long minutes, this team is going to be where they are. And he's had a 40-point game in the midst of this, 34, 31, 36 in the game against the Knicks You know, a few nights ago. So he's playing terrific basketball, and this team is clicking on all cylinders right now. James Harden is their facilitator. This is the reason why the Clippers wanted him, because now with George, if he plays Kawhi Leonard, they've got a lot of guys that can do a lot of different things. So really difficult matchup for the Mavericks tonight, as again, they'll fortunately be shorthanded with missing guys like Derek Lively and Kyrie Irving once again. Yeah, definitely. And I think you look at the stretch of uh, you know games, as you mentioned, with Kawhi and his production being elevated. A big part of it with this Clippers team is they have just so many options they can rely on that they, those guys can pick their spots. And honestly, at this point of their careers, you know, something that's been admirable for, for all four of those, you know, likely future Hall of Famers, whether you're talking about, you know, George Leonard, Westbrook, or Harden, is that they don't really care about their stats at this point. Like, they're, mm-hmm. they're willing to ha- have like, a, okay, this isn't my night. I'm shooting, you know, not that great. I have 16 points. Who cares? Uh, like, their, their goal is to win a title. And, you know, that's, that's commonly a cliche and, you know, there's things that go on for a lot of teams, you know, where you think that's the perception. It's not really what it is, but I think with this Clippers team, that's a you know, sign of something special. And that's a big factor in being able to pull things off, like winning eight straight games, especially against some of those tougher teams. So, you know, like if George is out, they've been able to pick their spots, uh, you know, in other games to where they can step up and handle that load. And then, you know, if he returns the lineup, if he did miss tonight, they're able to not miss a beat, uh, you know, in their next matchups because, you know, they've, they haven't had to, you know, really break too much of a sweat. You know, if you think about it with having that many options in their offense. So, you know, the Mavericks, it's been a different situation. Lucas had to shoulder a very heavy load and he's going to be the only all-star that's available tonight. So it'll be, uh, you know, definitely another interesting challenge where the other teams got, you know, quite a few options, whether George plays or not. And Luca will try to pull off something, you know, phenomenal, uh, you know, in his own right. And but beyond him, as we said, it takes a lot of help uh, to be able to beat some of these top teams in the Western Conference. So who steps up, who doesn't? It'll be interesting to watch because, you know, there are plenty of options on this, uh, you know, Clippers team to apply pressure on Luca, and it's going to be very important if they dare someone to shoot that those shots fall, and you know, whatever interior presence they can have they're going to need uh, whatever they can get against Zubac. Grant, tell the folks where they can find you. What you got going on, man? Yeah, for sure. You can find just a lot of coverage of the Mavs on DallasBasketball.com. 
and uh, I'm actually going to be doing uh, some other, uh, you know, content about the other Texas teams this weekend on those other SI sites. I'll probably, I'm not, I'm not sure who yet, but I'll probably try to interview someone on the Rockets and the Spurs and have something up from there and, you know, have some Mavs related angles to those conversations as well. So uh, yeah, definitely a lot of work on the SI.com ecosystem for sure. Starting to get fired up as we get toward the quote unquote unofficial start of the NBA season with Christmas Day just right around the corner. Things starting to heat up in the association as we get deeper and deeper into this season. Mavericks taking on the Clippers on Wednesday night with pregame, beginning with myself at seven o'clock on the Dallas Mavericks Radio Network. 97 won the freak with tip off at 7 30 at the America Airlines Center between the Mavericks and and the Clippers. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, my channel at Kevin Gray Sports. Subscribe to Grant's channel at Grant Asseth. And follow Inside the Mavs on Twitter at Inside the Mavs, the official account for the Inside the Mavericks podcast, where you can see all of our uh, shows and also everything else related to Inside the Mavs and also Mavs related tweets there also. And you can download and subscribe to the official. Mavericks podcast of 97 won the freak inside the Mavs on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcast for free episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here for inside the Mavs. That's it for today's show. Really appreciate you joining us. However, and wherever you may be listening to us and watching us, we'll be back on Friday to recap Wednesday's game between the Clippers and the Mavericks. Get you ready for the Rockets taking on the Mavericks and also the Spurs this weekend as well. So a lot to cover on our Friday episode of Inside the Maz. For Grant, I'm Kevin. This has been the latest episode of Inside the Maz. We'll talk to you Friday. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchases, over prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.